How do you go really fast? I talked about this in a previous video, the aerodynamics of speed, the theories behind designing a really slippery shape. But now it's time to put those theories into practice. Sounds pretty straightforward, but as Yogi Berra once said, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they're not. I can't really make a car that's perfect aerodynamically. I have to fit inside of it with a windshield and a crash structure. I need wheels sticking out of the bottom. The exhaust has to come out of somewhere. There are complications. But armed with this theory, with experience in this sort of thing, and with analysis help from AirShaper, I have converged on a design that is efficient, practical, and I think I can actually make it. Fast cars want to be streamlined. They want to be smooth and slippery, rounded in the front and tapered to a point in the back. The worst thing you can have in a fast car is obstructions just sticking out into the air all willy-nilly. Random tubes and parts and spinning tires just freeballing it out there in the wind. Basically this. This is my land speed car and it is the worst thing you can have aerodynamically, short of an actual parachute, which it also has. This is the bad news. The good news is the only direction I have to go is up. And by up, I mean forward. I don't want to go up. I did a lot of design using AirShaper. They are sponsoring the build with some analyses. Wouter Remery, who heads up AirShaper, stopped by on his trip through California a few weeks ago, and we chatted about my design and my results. I really like AirShaper. I've had a lot of luck with it. It simplifies CFD, so you don't need a PhD and $20,000 in software. I learned a lot of useful things about designing a car for speed, and I got to correlate an analysis with the run I did at Bonneville this year, which gives me a lot of confidence in future analyses. <laughs> I ran this car at the Salt Flats this year totally naked, no body. This was a terrible idea for a couple of reasons. One is that it covered every possible surface and crevice with salt, water, and salt water, corroding everything, but that is a story for another time. The other reason it was a bad idea is the fact that it has the aerodynamic drag of an 18-wheeler. This is not a joke. Based on the analysis in this configuration, it has a coefficient of drag of 0.825, which is worse than an actual 18-wheeler. It's a much smaller vehicle, so total drag is less, but the shape is real bad. We can garner some useful information from this, however. One is that the car is not very aerodynamically stable. By this, I mean it doesn't want to stay in a straight line. If you throw a dart, it lands nose first, usually, because the fins in the back keep it pointing forward. This car has no fins, so it's not surprising that it doesn't want to stay pointing forward. This was obvious when driving it. The faster I went, the less stable it felt. The only thing keeping it pointing forward was the guy inside with the handlebars, and even that didn't work that well. It got pretty bad, and I decided to pack it up after the last run when the car got squirrely, pushing me all the way off of the race course. The analysis backs up this instability. I ran three analyses on the car, one pointed straight ahead, one yawed one degree to the right, and one two degrees to the right. This number here is the moment about the yaw axis. It's basically just the force trying to turn the car. At zero degrees, it should be zero. It's not, because as we discussed, the car is an aerodynamic nightmare like this. Basically just buffeting and turbulence everywhere. But the concerning part is that it doesn't change, or at least not very much. Just driving the car straight, it wants to rotate, and there's no force making it want to rotate back. Basically the opposite of a dart. This is bad. But it does confirm my suspicion that driving the car like this at any real speed is a bad idea. AirShaper also spits out a nice chart that shows the power you need at any given speed. This is just for aerodynamics, so it doesn't take into account rolling resistance from the tires, drag from the bearings, and powertrain losses, but it does give me the data that I expect to see. Banks was nice enough to give me one of their awesome iDash gauges. This shows pretty much any data you want, speed, temperature, whatever, but more importantly here, it logs all of that data. The timing lights on the salt flats are at one mile intervals, so when they told me I was going 141 miles per hour, that was actually just the average speed over a mile. My top speed, according to my iDash, was 157 miles per hour. Now, this is not as fast as this car will go in this configuration. It's not its top speed. It's just as fast as I wanted to go because it got all squirrely on me. But I could tell that I was starting to run out of power. I was getting into some serious air resistance. My guess is that it would have peaked somewhere around 180 miles per hour had I been able to push it to the limit. Let's take a look at this graph. I know the letters here are strange and confusing. W. M over S. This is some unit system that's used by a few countries, probably like one or two. I'll convert it to horsepower and miles per hour. Much better. Looking at this graph, we can see that with the estimated top speed of 180 miles per hour, the car would require about 130 horsepower just to overcome aerodynamic drag. The car dynoed at 195 horsepower at sea level, but since Bonneville salt flats are at altitude, we lose 18% of our power there. 
That leaves another 30 horsepower. We can account for that by bearing friction and rolling resistance, which seems reasonable considering that the salt was more like mud than a hard packed surface. So the analysis seems to correlate to the real world pretty nicely, and we have some confidence that future analyses will also be accurate. If you've been following the channel, you know that the basic shape of the body I'm planning is something like this. It's round in the front, tapers down in the back, has a super fast mat in there somewhere. This body is based on basic theory and some initial design work I did a while back, but I didn't really get as far as I wanted to with the design, and I'd really like to do that before I start building it. I also want to know if I can simplify the design to make it easier to build without making it worse. I can't do a ton with the middle of the car, at least not the middle top, the canopy. I need a windshield. It's raked back about as far as I'd like it to be. It looks pretty good. The part back here that covers the engine is pretty much just a straight extrusion back, but the nose and the tail can be improved, and the side here can be considerably simplified. Let's start with that. The car is 22 inches wide. This is based on the shoulder width of the driver plus the crash structure. The wheels are just inside that. The frame narrows slightly as it goes down, but the front tires need to steer and the rear tires need some stability. So the widest part of the body is about 22 inches all the way down. I could narrow the body at the bottom between the front and the rear tires, but that doesn't really gain me anything. A better idea might be to just go straight down from the belt line all the way from the back of the front tires to the back of the rear tires. This makes this part of the body three flat pieces. The advantage of this is I don't need to make a fiberglass body for this. I don't have to make a mold, I don't have to lay fiberglass, I can just use flat pieces of plastic with a radius between them. Actually, I don't even need separate pieces. You know how to bend plastic? You get a heat strip and warm up a seam and then you just bend it. So I could get a 4x8 sheet of plastic and bend it up 22 inches apart in the middle. Then I have a plastic taco I can just shove under my car. I could actually make this out of Lexan and have a clear body side, which would be super cool for about 45 minutes until the outside got coated with dust and the inside with grease and oil. The thing I don't like about this is that these benders usually give a tight radius. I have it designed for a larger radius so the air won't get too disturbed if it wants to come out from under the car. This might not matter, I need to do some more analyses to see if it does, but I could design a fixture that has a steel tube in the middle that is the diameter I want, with braces at angles I want. Then I can put a heating element above it, maybe two or three wires hooked up to some batteries or something, then the plastic will just droop around the tubes, giving me the exact bend I need. This actually looks more complicated than making just a fiberglass piece. Why do I always do this? I originally designed the front kind of like the front of a teardrop. This is the ideal shape to reduce aerodynamic drag when flying through the air. But my car will not be flying through the air, assuming everything is going well. Instead, it is on the ground, which changes things a bit. I had done an optimization run on the nose using Air Shaper, and it kept moving the nose forward and down, so I thought, why don't we just push it real far forward and all the way down and see what happens. This is the drag coefficient. Lower is better. Without a body, it was 0.825. Most cars are a little less than half that, and my starting design is about 0.142, which is not bad. If we extend the nose by a foot, it drops down to 137. If we keep going, it doesn't really get better. In fact, it gets a tiny bit worse. But if we drop it down closer to the ground, it gets a lot better. This is in line with what you see out on the salt flats. A lot of these guys have been racing out here for years and have gone through lots of design. It's always nice to see when the computer agrees with experience. It is too round on the top. It needs to be pointy. It does need to be pointy. Let's make it pointy. And it's worse. It's also worse if we extend it way out and if it's all the way extended and pointy. This one seems to be the best here. I'm not quite done with the front, however. There is one big thing that needs to change, and that is the gap between the front wheels. This will make it a lot easier to see out the front, but it also should help aerodynamics. You can see the air is accelerating a lot over the front wheels, and then it has to dip back down just in front of the windshield. If I pull down the center between the wheels, this should give a path for the air to get to the windshield and give a better flow around the tires and the windscreen. I did one quick run on this, pulling the valley way down about as far as it could go, and this ended up being a little bit worse, I think because the air is being compressed into this channel here. I'll try a few different depths and see what works best. There is a rule of thumb that a diffuser should not be more than about 7 degrees of divergence, otherwise you start to lose efficiency. There are a lot of variables that affect this and many reasons you might want to reduce efficiency to gain maximum downforce, but I figured it was a good starting point for the tail. But I wanted to see what happens if I were to reduce the angle by extending the tail. Would this reduce the drag? Nope. In fact, it makes it worse. Part of the drag is the shape of the car, but another component is the friction of the air moving across the surface. 
The more surface you have, the more skin friction you have. AirShaper will show the pressure and friction components of drag, and you can see that extending the tail will reduce the air pressure drag slightly, but the added friction drag more than cancels it out. It gets even worse as you go up from there. But if I started with something that is better than going longer, maybe I can go shorter. So I chopped a couple of feet off the back, and it got better. So I chopped another foot off, and it pretty much stayed the same. So I chopped another foot off, and it got worse. At this point, the low pressure and turbulence in the back is causing so much more drag than the reduced skin friction drag. I ended up picking a length between these two, partly because that's how long the tubes I already have are. I can just chop out this section, bolt this part to the back here, and I'm done. I also did this because there are sometimes side winds. If I'm at the best possible angle in the back and there's some small wind from the side, then the windward side effectively moves longer, but the other side goes in the opposite direction, which could cause drag to go way up. But if I'm here, the tail, in theory, is less susceptible to non-ideal wind conditions. So this is good. It will make the car overall shorter and easier to make a body for. However, this does almost certainly make the car less stable. The long tail acted like the fins on a dart, and now we don't have those fins anymore. I need the center of aerodynamic pressure to be well behind the center of mass, and as the tail gets shorter, the center of pressure moves forward. I can fix this with a fin. This would, in theory, add back all that skin friction we just took away, but it doesn't for a couple of reasons. One is that I can add less area than I took away, partly because I don't need as much correcting moment as the original design gave me. But also because the fin is a teardrop shape, it is the perfect shape for minimizing drag. The drag coefficient of the fin is super low, it's basically zero. It's worth noting here that all of the comparisons I've been making have been between drag coefficients. The total drag is a function of the coefficient and the area of the car when you're looking at it from the front. The area has been the same for all the comparisons that I've made up until now, so it doesn't matter that I've ignored that part but the added fin does add frontal area. This analysis actually shows a lower drag coefficient than without the wing, but it has a slightly higher total drag. I don't exactly know what fin size I need in the back. I think the initial design is probably gonna be based on just looking at what everybody else is doing and sort of copying their homework. A removable fin gives the added benefit of being able to make it larger or smaller in the future based on how it feels. Excellent question. Remember that naked analysis we did? We took that graph and extrapolated some data from it. There seems to be a 20% loss from rolling resistance and other unknowns. Knowing this, we can take the graph from the best body design and see how fast it will go with the same power. Now the plan is for this thing to run on two cylinders. I've been running it on four. I haven't dyno tested it on two cylinders yet, but let's assume half the power of four. It'll be a little less for various reasons, but half is a good estimate. So half of 195 horsepower, corrected for the lower power at altitude, and reducing that by 20% for rolling resistance and other unknowns, gives us just under 50 kilowatts. We could plot that on this graph here, drop it down to a velocity, and see that we will be going 118 meters per second. Is that fast? I don't know. Let's convert that. It comes out to 265 miles per hour. That's over 50 miles per hour faster than the record in this category. But wait a minute. What if we run all four cylinders? Accounting for elevation and a 20% drop, that gives us 96 kilowatts. We'll just extend this graph up and drop that line down to 325 miles per hour. Wow. Now, there are a few things wrong with this. One is that there are a lot of assumptions here. I estimated my top speed from the previous analysis. I didn't actually go 180 miles per hour. We extrapolated this graph beyond its limit, so this is just a guess. The car will have different rolling resistance at higher speeds, and the salt will be different next year, so that 20% could go up or down. And we have to actually make the body, which means it won't be a perfect shape like this. There will be body seams and Zeus fasteners and wheel cutouts and lots of little things that will ruin this nice number we have here. Still, I like that this gives a much better number than the record. It gives me confidence that I can actually do this. And this number here makes me kind of want to stick with a 1 liter engine. How cool would it be to go 300 miles per hour? We already talked about this part in the middle, some plastic, maybe HPDE, folded up like a taco, fastened to the body, probably with flush quarter turns covered with some speed tape. The rest of the body, more difficult. It will be fiberglass, and I hate fiberglass. I hate laying it up, I hate cutting it. It's all just the worst. And yes, I could form it out of metal, but that sounds worse, especially considering that I have neither the tools nor the experience to make these complex shapes. Now, we're gonna use fiberglass, and I'm gonna start with the back. The reason I'm gonna start with the back is because that is the least critical part for having a nice surface finish. By the time the air gets back here, the boundary layer is as thick as it's going to be, and this part seems like a relatively easy shape to do, so we'll start there. The plan here is to get some foam and mill it out on my CNC router. This thing only has six inches of travel in Z, so I'll have to make up four parts and then stick them together. 
I might just use that pink insulating foam from the hardware store. There is foam made for this kind of thing, but it's way more expensive. I'm not that worried about weight, so I can actually be a little cheap and lazy with this, which are my two favorite things to be. The right way to do this is to make a plug of the part I'm gonna make and then pull a mold off of that, and then you pull the actual part out of the mold. I'm not gonna do this because I don't want a 25 foot long car's worth of molds sitting around in my garage. I'm not gonna keep any molds. If I need new parts, I'll just redo the whole process. No, the plan is to cut the negative into the foam, spray that with some epoxy to get a nice candy shell, and then some mold release on top of that. I'll use a vacuum pump to pull resin into the mold and let that cure, and then I'll take the part out of the mold, at which point it will absolutely not come out of the mold because it never works that way. And so I'll pry, I'll peel, I'll hit it with a hammer, completely destroying the mold and eventually the entire part before I throw it all in the trash and set the land speed car on fire. I really hate fiberglass. I'll probably have to do some of these parts multiple times. I have never had a fiberglass part come out correctly the first time. Hopefully by the time I get to the front of the car, we will have learned something about fiberglass and about patience, and I will be able to make the nose of the car without setting anything on fire. Before I do any of this, I need to 3D scan the entire car because it's probably not exactly like the CAD, and I'd rather have the body conform to the actual car than the idealized CAD car. But before I do that, I need to put the car back together because it's currently in about 300 pieces. But it will get done, and I promise I will have a body on this car in time for Bonneville Speed Week. Maybe not 2024 Speed Week, but some Speed Week. I mostly finished this video about a week ago, but then I got the COVID and had a bunch of free time. So I decided to do a bunch more analyses that I figured I'd just talk about. I was going to kind of wait to do these until I 3D scan the whole car and then I could do the finalized design around that, but we're close enough. There were a few interesting things that helped out. Uh, the car is now a fastback. And I also kind of did the same thing under the bottom of the car. This was a straight line and I kind of curved it a little bit. Both of those things helped out. I also reduced the depth of that groove in the nose between the tires that helped out a little bit. I talked about trying a smaller radius on the bottom and I did that and I also tried a larger radius. I was running just over about an inch down here and I tried two inches and I tried basically zero inches and interestingly both of them are better, which I was surprised to see. I figured one of them would be better and one of them would be worse. So on that I will probably go with that tight radius since I can just do that bending plastic thing with a heat strip, which will make it way easier. This did get me thinking though about narrowing up the bottom. I said that if I pulled the body in in between at the at the base where it narrowed down, it probably wouldn't help. Well, I double checked that and sure enough, it doesn't help. It makes it worse. I did try raising the ground clearance a little bit. I had it pretty close to the ground, but I wanted to see what happens if I moved it up because that makes a few things easier. And it actually is about the same. It's like a tiny bit worse, but it's about the same, which was kind of surprising. I figured going up three quarters of an inch would make it noticeably worse. It does make a lot of other things easier, and I think it will allow me to smooth out the front. I can drop down the bubble above those front tires a little bit, smooth out that air, so overall drag might go down if I can kind of optimize it a little bit. I also decided to do a high downforce configuration. This is using the wings on my friend Robin Schutz, Pikes Peak Hill Climb winning car. This has a pretty bad drag, but the drag coefficient is actually about the same as the naked car. That's how bad the naked car was. You throw a front and rear giant wing on it, and it doesn't get much worse than just having no body on it. If I could muster the 400 some odd horsepower to get this thing up to the record breaking speed, I could actually break the 500 cc record upside down in this configuration. So that's pretty cool. I think the real challenge with this body is going to be making something that is smooth on the outside, doesn't have a lot of obstructions like fasteners or seams. It's going to be challenging to make the cutouts for the wheels. I'll have to put some deflectors in front of the wheels and some little things to sort of bring the air in behind them. I'm going to make an actual fin for the back. So there's a lot of still a lot of work left to be done, but um, we're getting there and it's uh, it's getting pretty interesting. By the way, the Cindy Club and Robin did a pretty good video on their aerodynamic analysis. You should check it out. It's in the description. I'll link it below. Uh, thanks for watching. We really are controlled by the algorithm. We live and die by it, and I don't want to die. So click that like button and subscribe if you haven't. I'd really appreciate it. It actually helps a lot. All hail the algorithm.